Smith. Uh, the ones here that don't know me, I'm Stacy Gaston. I got my wife over here on the end. I bet I can't get her to stand up, but this is her on the end right here. Her name is Dawn. If you watch me on video sometime, you see her fishing with me and uh, trying to pull in some big catfish. And so uh, it's just been a, it's an honor of mine to be here today and to be a part of this. We're going to cover some things today. and uh, I'm going to try my best in the next 40 minutes to cover some stuff. And before I close, I'm going to need somebody, like uh, probably 940, that when I get ready, say, hey, I'm going to put you in charge. Say, hey, before you close, you had something you wanted to tell us about, all right? So make sure that one of y'all does not let me forget that, all right? I want to say this. If y'all don't know me and don't keep up with me, I have. I'm a pastor. I've been preaching for 20 years. So you may see me start to uh, throw some stuff in about the Lord because the Lord has reminded me. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added to you. So I've learned about putting priorities in order and making sure that he's first and foremost in my life. And my wife is right behind that and my kids follow behind that right there. I know some people think, well, that might not be the right order. It is for me because my wife and my kids probably wouldn't want to put up with me if the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't in my life. So I want to thank you all today. And we're going to get started. There's some couple of things I want to uh, to cover, and I gotta find my glasses. Y'all ever watch me on YouTube? And y'all see me looking for these, don't you? I can see way in the back, but I can't see up close. I want to share this story before I even get started, because I'm gonna share some stories along the way. And um, I love flathead catfishing. I just love catfishing, you know, catching blues and everything. But I had a good buddy of mine by the name of Jesse Kilpatrick used to fish with me all the time. And we fish a section of the river called the Alabama River uh, Millers Ferry Reservoir. And that's where we fish at. And we was off one day and we was, y'all ever seen a, uh, one of them soft shell turtles? You know, y'all seen what color they are? So if you don't know, I'm fixing to describe this to you. They have a color resembling like the color of a flathead catfish. Y'all notice that? And so we threw over there and Jesse's got his pole and the pole starts to ease over and boy, he rears into him. I said, Jesse, you hung? He said, no, Stacy, he's pulling. I get the dip net, boy, and I'm back on the back of the boat. And if you watch me at all, I'm just pumping him up. Come on, Jesse, bring him up here, baby. And that thing, he's got him coming to the boat and there's a lot of pressure on him because this, this turtle is about 35 pounds. He's big. He's this big around. And I'm sitting back there and that thing comes in sight. You know how you want about three or four foot up on the water and you barely can see it? I look around at Jesse and says, good gosh almighty, his head's that wide. <laughs> and he went back down and my heart's pumping and my, I'm jumping and Jesse's sitting back there. I said, man, I'm telling you, his head was that wide. <laughs> we pull him up and he was that wide. Big old flathead, cat, uh, flathead uh, saw shell turtle. Um, I want to cover first what we're dealing with. Um, Camp fishing, and the first thing I want to tell you, I don't know, I know there's probably a lot of people here that has uh, got experience catching big fish. There may be some here that doesn't. I deal with a lot of people, especially where I'm from, they want to know how in the world do you catch these big fish? Well, I want to say this in foremost, because I believe it's one, that, I believe it's the most important thing that you can possibly do, is making sure you're prepared to catch a big fish. What good is it to get, get one on the hook and line? Because how many of y'all have got the story? Man, when I come home, I had him on, had him almost to the boat. And he broke my line. How many of y'all heard that? How many times has that ever happened to you? Because it happened to me year after year. And I began to learn, hey, you know what I got to do? I got to prepare myself to catch big fish. Now, if you out here catching some small ones, you can probably reel them in with a little bit of nothing. I carried a guy off one day. He wanted to go fishing with me. He said, what do I need to bring? I says, just bring yourself, bring you something to eat and drink, but I'm furnishing the rod and reels. He said, no, my granddaddy left me a rod and reel and I want to catch one on it. I said, I just prefer you to use my stuff. No, I want to use mine. And so he had his heart set on catching a catfish over 20 or 30 pounds. We fish all day. He's got his rod and reel out and I'm telling one, I call it freight training. You know what I'm talking about? He nailed it. He reached and grabbed it. I don't even know how much pressure was put on it. And he broke the line. 
I said, how long? When did your granddaddy give you that rod and reel? He said, probably about 10 years ago. I said, where's it been at? He said, it's been out there in my shed. I actually took the line. I took it and you could just pop it. I said, now you telling me that we spent all day fishing for this fish and you was not prepared to catch him. You know how hard it is to get hooked up with one anyhow, don't you? And the last thing I want to do is get hooked up with one and my line break. One of the key things is making sure that you've got some good knots and you've got some good line. And probably one of the most important things to me is this section of line that's right here. They call it the leader. How many of y'all catch four or five fish and you're in a hurry, especially when they're biting it, and you grab a piece of bait and you chunk it back out there and you never check that? Probably if you've seen any kind of videos, you see us pull them, flat, them big catfish in and your hands are just tore up. I mean, it's like 80 grit sandpaper. If this line is coming past that fish's mouth, you know what he's going to do? He's going to cut it. He's going he's to nick it up. He's going to damage it. Even if you get him in a boat, you need to always check. So if I feel something on this line right here, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to go back. I'm going to cut this leader off. I'm going to make sure that this part right here is good. And I'm going to retie me a new hook and a new line on here. That's what I'm going to do. Now, for years we fished with J-hooks. My daddy raised me fishing with J-hooks. And I also found out that I would have my line breaking. Now, you know, if you ever been out and you got your line hung and I'm pulling on it and pulling on it and we have pulled the anchor up trying to break it. I mean, 40-pound mono is pretty tough. And I've done that and you hang into a fish and a little bit of pressure put on it and your line break. And you wonder, how did that happen? I just pulled the boat off an anchor. How did that happen? Well, I will tell you a lot of times what happens is that fish gets his hook inside of his mouth where this leader line has to come past his teeth. And if that's a catfish, it's 15 pounds or so, and if he shakes his head twice, you know what he's going to do to that? He's going to cut it. That's what he's going to do. I call it, he didn't break your line, he just cut your line. And so I went with a hook. This right here is a Mad Catter XHD. And the circle hooks are designed to grab that fish in the corner of his mouth or somewhere like that so that hook does not get down in his throat and you eliminate that uh, possibility of that leader line coming past his mouth. And I tell people all the time, if I get him hung, hooked up with his TWC rod and I get him hooked, I'm like, hey guys, if the hook's set good, he don't know, unless he hangs me in the top, he's coming to the boat. Just take your time, make sure that you are prepared to catch a big fish, all right? Because I'm, uh, you know, man, a 25, 30 pounder can put some pressure on you. Make sure you prepare to do that. Here's one of the rigs that I use. Now, this is this is probably my favorite rig uh, for flathead fishing. Now, if you notice, and I fish on the Alabama River, most of the time they are they run they open generators up there, and that's how they control the flow and they move open run two or three generators sometime producing a current. And so here on this weight, I have something called a, I got a three ounce no roll. Uh, I don't use something that's seven, eight ounces. I don't particularly like that. I will use that if the current is really, really bad. I want this right here to like get, I want it to be able to get my bait to the bottom, but I don't want to be able to it throw out, just throw it out there and it just stay in one spot. I don't like that. I like to take it I like to put me a big old brim on it, throw it out, and I want the current to move, drag my lead around. And you know what I say it's doing? It's looking for that little hole to get in. Because I feel like if this lead ever pops down inside of a little hole, any kind of little cover there, any kind of little divot in the water, it's going to settle down. And you know where, you know where that fish is going to be at? He's going to be right where that lead has tried to settle at because it's right there. It's looking for the path of least resistance. So that's just my preference when I come to fishing. I do like this right here, slip lead. And if you don't use something like this, I do have some uh, sink, sinker sliders. And then if you notice this, I do not have my lead, uh, what we say, connected to my line, you know, permanently in one place. It's able to slide. And that's there for a reason. And, uh, and I'll tell you about that reason in a minute.
Go ahead. Can y'all can y'all hear? There's a little bit more room in here if y'all can push in. Is what he's saying, and maybe make a little bit more room for folks because there is some more room in here. I don't want you to leave on me because you get tired. Am I making any sense so far? So we've shared to start with about the tackle, how important the tackle is. And that right there is pretty simple stuff, but it's some stuff so many times, I am very guilty of it. Getting in a hurry, throwing back out, I don't feel like re-rigging something. And, but I've learned, man, that I have fished all day. The last thing that I want to do is get a big one hooked up and lose him. Now, I don't know about you. It makes me sick. You ever had them moments when you sit down in the boat? <laughs> Maybe y'all never had that. <laughs> I have. <laughs> and I'm like, man, how did he get off this close? The next thing, I want to deal with flathead catfishing. We got our rigs, making sure that we got the equipment that it takes to get one in the boat. Yeah, and I want to say the thing is just to make sure that your line and stuff, your knots is tied correctly, and you don't have no frays. Uh, in your line. Now, the next thing that I am a firm believer in, this is number two thing, is the bait. Uh, I am a firm believer in this. I don't use but three things. I either use brim, anybody know what that, bluegills, and I don't use them nothing but live. I don't cut them up, I use them live. That's my preference. I use shad, but I also use them two different ways. Now, I know some people are firm believers in uh, live bait, and I'm a firm believer in live bait. But I have discovered that I've probably caught just as many flatheads on shad that have been, that are dead than that are, that are alive. Now, but I will also tell you this. If you go fishing with me and we go out flathead catfishing, I'm going to have some brim in the tank when I leave the house, but I'm not going to have not one shad on me, none. I got a cast net. A guy asked me when we went out, he said, what we're going to fish with? I said, we don't get no shad. We won't be fishing. Because the way I looked at it, if we can't catch fresh shad to flathead catfish, there's probably no need for us to even be here. I've, I've, I've tried it a lot of different ways. I've tried uh, stuff that's been frozen, and I've caught blue cats on them, but I'm telling you, I've never caught a flathead on it. But with the shad, I do two things with them. I do use them, especially if I can find on the river I fish on, if we can get some that's probably six or seven inches long, them are big ones from where I'm from. I will take them, I'll put them in my live well, and I keep water running over them all the time. I want to keep them as lively as I can. If I get some of them, I also catch me some, and I keep me a bag, like an ice bag or a Ziploc bag in the boat, I keep ice in my cooler. I will catch some of them, and as soon as I pick them up, I put them in that bag and put them down in that ice. I do not want them sitting there soaking in that ice or in that water. I've been off with guys fishing, and I say, "What would you know?" They come by and pick me up. I want to carry you fishing. We get out there and we open the bait cooler up, and it is watered down ice with shad that's been there for four hours. No slime on them, nothing. You seen them? Some people call them man. They just washed out. I don't want that. Uh, live shad, and I will take that live shad, and most time I hook him right between the bottom lip and the top lip, something like that, or sometimes I'll take my time and go right through his eye socket. I want to get in sort of that hard, that bony uh, structure of his head, take him out there. He will stay alive a little bit better, especially in deep water, than that brim will. If I'm in some deep, if I'm in some current, I will take the brim and hook him between the bo uh, bottom and top lip the same way. I've also found out that if I hook him in the dorsal fin and there's much current there, he gets turned around backwards, and when I really mean he's dead. Y'all ever seen that? So if it's a little bit of, if it's much current, I hook him for the bottom lip and top lip and fish with him that way. That's the way he can just swim in the current so he's not turned around and the water flowing back through his gills, and I've noticed it, it kills him that way. Now, with the ones that are dead, I take them, and I'm telling you, I have had good success with this. 
I take that uh, shad, and uh, some of y'all have filleted a bass or crappie or something like that. I take my uh, uh, shad, I take my knife and lay at his tail, and I go right up his backbone all the way back to his gill plate, and I just take the knife out. You've exposed the belly, but it's also let that extra side there just sit there and flap in the current. I, to me, uh, I just think it gives a little bit of action when you sit there in current and that old piece of meat sitting there and flapping. Plus, I feel like I got all them guts going down through there, you know? And I, I feel confident if I have fresh shad and if I have me some live brim, before the day's over, we're going to put a fresh in the boat. And hopefully we're going to put one in there 30 plus pounds because catching one over 30 pounds sometimes can be a pretty good task. And when you get a hold to one like that, it can be fun. Because them boys will pull, won't they? How many of y'all ever caught a flathead? How many of you ever caught one over 30 pounds? They, I mean, they put, man, they'll, they'll, they'll put the smack down on it, you know what I mean? They hit it, boy, and you grab it, and man, I'm telling you. Now, I fish with them like this. I will also use another rig that if I am up in water that's probably uh, less than 20 foot deep, I will slow in some rocks. I will slow drift. And I just suspend some rigs. And I, I suspend them just like I have this one set up over here. And I just want to drop it down. I'll have live brim. And I will take them. And if you'll notice here, on this rig here, now this right here is stationary, and I use that. My, my hook and line does not slide through this. Y'all see the difference? And I'll hook, if I miss on suspend drift, I will take this and I will hook sometimes five, six ounces on here. With this snap, I can put as many on there as I need to. So if I needed 10 ounces or 11 ounces, I want to be able to hold that bait straight down. I don't, it, it irritates me to see my bait starting to slide backwards because I'm like, I put it on the bottom, I felt this lead when it hit the bottom, and I know that my leader line is so, I'm just going to reel it up, pick it up, and put it in a rod holder. And so I'm thinking to myself, it's probably about two foot off the bottom. And that little brim just sitting there just fluttering the whole time. And you easing down through there, and all of a sudden, you see that tip start to load up. You know what that is, don't you? But that, that right there is a two preference. That's the only way I fish for them. I anchor, and I do do some slow drifting in some shallower water. Now, I carried a guy out not long ago when we was out there, and we were sitting there fishing, and while we was, we was down the river anchored up in 40 foot of water, and we were sitting there talking and carrying on the whole, and we moved up in some water that was around 12 to 15 foot deep. A lot of rocks, and I quit talking. Whether my wife can believe that or not, I stopped. I, that was with me because he's probably he's used to me. First thing he we sit over he says, "What's wrong with you?" He said, "I said well, nothing's wrong." He said, "Well, you ain't talking near as much as you was." I said, "We in 12, 15 foot of water." I said, "Them fish is right up under us, and we're going over the top of them." I said, "Do not bang your feet on the bottom of this boat. Save very little bit and don't move none." Because I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you know, 10 or 12, 15 foot. It's really not that deep. Now, I don't want to jump out of the boat and see how deep it is, but I'm telling you, it's really not that deep. And my thing is, he's right up under us. These fish are right up under us. And a lot of times, people never look at this. They jump, they're walking around the boat. And if you're in an old aluminum boat like I had, beating around, you're making noise, you're sitting there talking, and, and me hooping and hollering, I said, hold on, we got to stop this for right now. We'll go back when we hook up with one, but we need to be really, really quiet because, you know, if anybody hunts, anybody's after wild game or something, what is the thing? You want to be able to sneak up on him. Is that not what you want to do? You want to be able to just sort of ease in that where he's at? Now you're on his territory, you know? You don't go turkey hunting and you don't go deer hunting with a cowbell and let them, you know, hey, we're here to catch you, we're here to kill you. But you know what's going to happen? They're not used to you being there. And the first thing they're going to do, man, they're gone. So we want to be really, really quiet, especially when we get into shallow water. I have a bad habit. I want to listen to the radio, but when I get serious about fishing, I even cut it off. I don't know if they can hear it, but I'm thinking I don't want to give them a choice 
on this. I don't really want them to know that I'm here once I get set up. All right? So live brim and shad, either live or cut. And I don't use them as cut pieces. I use them as a whole shad, just sort of sliced up the side and just sit there and let it flop. Uh, just let it go in the current, all right? Now the next thing, there's a couple things that I'm looking for. Me and my wife was off. We like to go brim fishing uh, every year. And around April, end of April, we use it as a trip up. And man, we go after them big old brim like that. And so we over here, I don't never go fishing that I ain't got my rods and reels with me. We come out of a little old creek. We had sit in there and caught some brim on my live well. We probably got 50 or 60 in it. And on the side of the bank, there was an old wood yard that was there where they loaded stuff. And they had come in and they had brought some slabs of concrete and dumped them off as erosion control. As soon as I come out and I seen that concrete there, Dawn said, what you fixing to do? I said, I'm going to anchor down right here and we're going to catch this flathead that's in them holes right there. Because if you ever look, when you see on the bank, you start seeing that concrete that's laid up and stacked. Can you see all them holes that's in there? You know where that catfish has done got? Stacked up in one of them. That's where he's at. And sure enough, we pulled up there, and it wasn't but, a, wasn't but a few minutes, and we pulled one out of there. I like to look for stuff like that. Boulders, you know, some big rocks and stuff. I found out, man, that them flatheads love to hang around that. One of my favorite places to fish is when I'm going somewhere new and I'm looking for something, I go on my Navionics app or web chart. You can get on it on your computer and begin to look around. And I'm looking for some specific things. I love the mouth of creeks. I'm, um, I'm addicted to them things. Creeks and big sloughs. If you see where somebody is up in a creek or somebody is in some backwater, where I come from, we call them sloughs. Is that what y'all call them? And I see a, a lot of people that's in these things that's catching crappie and catching brim. I'm like, this is the place we need to be flathead fishing. Because you know what flathead eat? They eat crappie and they eat brim. I will watch as I'm going up and down the river. If I come fisherman and he is over our crappie fishing, he's been sitting there for two, two or three hours. Well, I'm going to tell you, let me just tell you a secret. He ain't sitting in one spot for nothing for two or three hours. You know why he's there? The possibility of him there, he's catching some fish there. Every time you come by, he's in that Always when I go by and I look at him, I reach up on my graph and I just mark a waypoint. I'm like, there's a top over there up on that water somewhere. I come back later and check this. When he's gone, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fish that spot. Because you know why? Because if there's a top there and there's crappie in it, I promise you, the flathead, he's not from it. You know as well as I do, when it comes supper time, I can find you, can't I? I don't know if I can find you, but you can find me. Uh, when uh, Mama gets ready supper cooked, I told him one time, Daddy called me and says, Supper's going to be ready about 5 o'clock. Are you going to be able to be here? Uh, well, we, Mama's got a big old table, holds about eight people, you know, and I got my spot on the very And Daddy's on the other end, what we always said. I told Daddy, I said, Daddy, when you stand and look at the other end of the table, I'll be there. Mama's cooking collard greens, and she's got some hog neck in, that, in there, and we're going to have us some uh, dressing. I said, I'll be there. Why? Because I'm going to be there when it's feeding time. And I'm going to tell you, the reason that flathead is in a certain place, why is it? Because there is a food source that is there. So I'm looking for them places like that. If I can find a major creek, and a lot of times where something is like 15 or 12 foot deep that goes up into a slough, and it may go back up in there, and it may be 10, it may be less than 10 foot. A lot of brims in there, a lot of ba uh, bass, a lot of crappie. I don't go up in that slough and fish. I don't fish up in there. A lot of times them things will come out and dump into the river, and when they dump in, it comes in and just comes up on a ledge. I don't know if there's anything to this, but somehow or another, I got this in my mind. That he stages out here and he eats in there. Have you ever thought about that? I'm like, he's, he lives out here, eats in there. And so I get out there and I've looked on these ledges. It, that lava to come out of 10, lava to come out of five foot of water. And when it comes, 
that just sort of drops off and may drop into 35 foot. If you ever look right there on that edge, on that ledge, you're going to start to see some fish in there. I'm looking for a spot like that. Another thing that I look for is driving down the river. I'm, it, have y'all ever seen when you're going down the river and you see an inset in the bank, currents flowing, and all of a sudden you see it where it hits a pocket and it begins to cause a swirl, a reverse flow? I'm like, we need to fish this spot right here. I always looked at that because I'm like, something has happened here to change the, the course of the water. Now, a fish is doing one thing. He's eating to survive. That's what he does. And so he's doing one thing. He needs to conserve energy, and he needs to eat. That's what he's after. And so I'm looking for places that he can get behind, that he ain't got to sit there and swim all day to try to waste all of his energy. I'm looking for little places that he can get over here and yet be in an ambush spot. So if there's a little indention in the bank, a little hole that's in scent, uh, in, uh, in set into that bank, I'm looking for things like that. And a lot of times I will go past it and anchor up so I can fish right off in that hole right there. Now the next thing that I do, that's, that's two spots. The mouth of creeks and get on that ledge. The mouth of sloughs and get on that ledge. Look for little pockets. And I, oh, well, I got a couple more spots. Yeah, Y'all ever seen them clay in South Alabama? Y'all I'm from South Alabama, can't you? <laughs> Hopefully by now. We have some, you coming down the Alabama River, we have some clay banks. And you know, I, for some reason in my mind, when I see that clay bank, I have identified that every time I fish a clay bank, whether it was intentionally or intentionally, that I caught flatheads bomb. But I also notice this. You riding down the road and you see clay banks, what do you see? You're going to see some holes and where some little insets in it. I'm telling you, if you see a clay bank, a lot of times a clay bank has formed because the trees have it washed off of there. It's going to cause a little bit of structure to be there. But it also, I believe that clay bank has got some holes and stuff that are there. I love to fish a spot like that. And so if I see a clay bank, we're going to fish it. The mouth of a creek or mouth of a slough, I'm going to fish it. If we see um, some structure here, we're going to fish it. Now, one of the things that I'm using that I've learned over the years. Now, my daddy is a little bit old fashioned. He tells me I'm cheating all the time. And so I got, I got my electronics. And I, I put some pictures on Facebook the other day. I don't know if y'all seen it, but I, I run a Hummingbird. I run a Hummingbird 9, I run a Hummingbird 12. Both of them have Mega, one of them's got a Mega Plus on it. And I actually got a picture of a spoonbill Cat spoonbill on there. I don't know if y'all seen that, but you can see him just as good. And so I come home, I, my daddy sees it. Son, that right there is pure cheating. I said, well, daddy, everybody else is using them. I might as well use them. <laughs> he said, what do you do? You just drop your hook over and snatch him up. I said, no, it ain't that easy now. <laughs> I, I wish it was. <laughs> but it has made me, I do not fish in a top. I don't, I don't do it. And this is the reason why. Now, I will fish around that top, and I know some people that pull up, man, I've seen them. They will pull up, they will spot a lot, and have the back of their boat sitting right at the back of a log jam with the rods just right off in it. And every time you see them, you know what they tell me? Man, we hung a big one today, but we couldn't get him out of there. And this is my mindset. I use my side imaging. Anybody familiar with side imaging? Let me tell you the way I use this where them tops is at and I will go up through there and if I'm looking at tops on my side imaging and I'm seeing them on both sides of the boat I know they everywhere I keep moving my boat out a little bit and all I want to do is find them tops is on my right hand side and none on my left you know what that lets me know I'm right here at the end of them do you see where I'm coming from I'm right out here at the end of them and so I will pull my boat up and I will try to anchor out here on the end of this top. And my, my, my ideology is I'm not going to go in that top after him. I'm hoping I can entice him to come out here and grab my bait in this clean water. Because I feel like if I get him hooked up out here, we're going to bring him to the boat. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? And so it eliminates me just having my bait right there in the top and everything I've got being tangled up. 
Now, I'll tell you, it ain't that I don't get hung up because I get hung up a lot, but I'm trying to find that little spot to get that bait right out on the edge of it and maybe pull him out of that top right there. I mentioned one more, one more thing about bait. I didn't know this until a couple years ago. Matter of fact, last year. I was all trying to get some shad, and I was catching something just once in a blue moon. We would catch some. I didn't have a clue what it was. And I told somebody on Facebook, I had one. And I'm telling you, if you see me fishing with live bait, I have fished with some stuff this big. It don't get too big. I mean, man, listen, 12 inches long. Hook him right through the middle of the lip. I was over there, a buddy of mine says, what you got? I said, look what I got for bait. He says, you'll never catch anything on that. I said, you'll be surprised what I catch. And I'm telling you what else you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised how small a fish I'll catch with that big of a bait. I take a bait this big and catch a 15 pounder. I'm telling you, have you ever seen a flathead's mouth? 15 pounder, man, you just got a mouth that big on him. They, I put it on there, I said, if you ever get one of these, I mean, they're like gold to me. I would buy them today if I knew where to buy them at. And so I put this thing, I said, I don't know what they are, but if you got one of these things, hook him on your line, I'm telling you, a flathead fish can't resist him. And a guy responded back and said, that is a quill back sucker. I don't know if you've ever seen one of them. And I thought then, I've been on the internet looking to somebody to sell live quill back suckers. <laughs> I thought to have me a tank of them and put him on there. <laughs> I, need, I need that, don't I? <laughs> I, I? I need me a spot to raise them things in. I'm telling you, get something like that right there. And sometimes, we was down in Florida, and it was one of these, one of these incidents that my wife was right about this. Don't y'all tell her I said that, all right? But I, I preach this on, on, my, on, my, on my videos and stuff. I get to a big fish like this, I will use two hooks. I will hook one through his lip, and I will use another hook to put back there in his back. Because I have seen that them, I don't know just what they're doing, but in my mind, he's coming up, grabbing that bait, starting to pull it off. And man, he will pull your rod over like this. And you will think you got him. I've seen it where they put some pressure on it and you pick it up and all of a sudden now, nothing. He's got the back of that bait. We was down in Florida, we had, a, we had something on that this big. Said, we're gonna pull us a big one out. And sure enough, we was there and as we was there, man, that old rod kept, kept loading up and it loaded and doubled over and when it did, I tied into it, got him all the way to the boat. But I done got the net. I'm sitting there ready. My heart is just beating like this right here. Probably y'all don't do that. You know what I mean? But mine does. And I'm sitting there and I'm just waiting to see him. And all of a sudden, man, the low lines boat and it just comes loose. That was one of them times. And I'm sitting down. I got my hand on my head. And my wife says, you should have put two hooks on it. She says, even I've watched your videos. <laughs> so every time I get in a hurry, because I don't always fish with a two-hook system, I think I reach in there and grab one of them big ones out and hook it through the lip, and I hear her voice. Even I've watched your videos. I'm like, we'll take and we'll tie this and we'll put us two hooks on here because I don't want to have the opportunity to have an a 30 plus flathead on my hook and him not have it in his mouth. So I feel like if he'd come and grab the back of it and he started to pull off with it, I've got that hook in the bow, and bam. I'm like, you didn't know that one was there, did you? <laughs> Let me share one other thing. Y'all still with me? Don't let me bore you, all right? Now, this is another thing, but I had some around the house. And one of the things that I want to do, I, I love catching big fish, but I want to see you catch them. If you want to get your kids involved, if you want to get all uh, involved in catfishing, man, you want to catch big fish. And you're catching them on rod and reel. I mean, that right there is adrenaline rush that I still have not got over. I'm addicted to watching the end of that pole load up. I mean, I could sit there all day and just watch the end of that pole load up. I'm like, that's what I'm here for. 
And, and, and Les, I've been sitting there all day. Y'all probably don't do this, but I do. You sit there all day and you, you, you preach this and you teach this. Don't take that rod. Let him, let him load it up. Let him pull it down. And you fished all day long. And your rod tip, it looked just like that right there all day. And if you've been out eight hours fishing, and all of a sudden you see it go. <laughs> and I go, uh-oh. <laughs> I get up out of my seat. <laughs> and he loads up on it a little bit more and pulls it down right there. And one of the things I constantly teach, if somebody's in the boat with me, I'm like, do not touch it. <laughs> and what do I do? After sitting eight hours, it loads up. <laughs> My gosh, I ain't taking no more chances with you. <laughs> I'm grabbing it and I'm setting the hook. <laughs> and, you, and he's not there. I'm like, well, I've waited eight hours. I got too excited and I let him get away. Now, there were some guys around the house that had never caught big fish. And he said, Stacy, we want to know how to catch them. Like, how do we catch these big ones? And this is what he told me. I said, go get you some live brim. This is what I've told you. I said, make sure you got you some equipment to hold something. This bear flathead man will pull. And he's going to pull you down some stuff. Just hang, get to have something. And every time he would come back, he says, well, every time we get over there, he says, Stacy, they, they just get my rod and they pull it over a little bit and daddy grabs it and he sets the hook and we miss them. He said, all there is is little ones over there. I said, no. Now, I, I seen this on Facebook. There was somebody doing video or seminar and somebody asked the Pacific question does them flatheads ever bite real funny and I want to thank the guy that will answer he said no they just usually slam it down I'm like no 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 not where I'm from they don't I've seen them do this right here and I have watched the flat I'm talking about something 30 or 40 pounds this is why I brought this rod with me have you ever seen it start to load up and pull right there and stop and ease back up and ease it back down and he's sitting there and it's just holding there and I'm thinking to myself you need to hurry up or I'm going to snatch it out of your mouth and he eases back down a little bit I've had it sit right there and hold and let back up most people will grab it and think there's a little one messing with it I'm telling you don't touch it if you can fight your willpower off don't touch it <laughs> Y'all see where my problem's at, don't you? <laughs> Maybe I need more willpower. Because <laughs> eight hours of him not doing nothing to it, I get do get a little antsy. Don't, let, don't touch that thing. I like to get it, and when it starts doing that, I'm like, I got him now. But I have sit there as much as 15 or 20 minutes and see him sit there, pull it over, let it back up. Boy in the boat with me saying, he's just a little bitty one. I said, no. I said, a little bitty one sits there and does this right here to it all the time. I said, but if they ever go to pulling it over like this and holding, I said, he's not no little bitty one. We got ourselves something. Just hang on. If you've got the patience here, we're going to be able to catch this fish. So them little details right there. And this guy come back. He was a student of mine in my welding class. He come in there every week, picked my mind. Went and got him some rods and rings. Sent me a picture. He's got one put up over the side of the boat. He says, me and my daddy got him. He was 40 pounds. I said, what'd you do? He said, I didn't touch that rod till the tip was in the water. I, I said, my favorite said, I don't forgot who said this. I said, don't miss it. Don't touch it until it goes four eyes deep. <laughs> then right there is just some keys that's going to be able to increase your hookup rate and catching some big fish. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to answer the question, but I want to do one more thing. Because also, I'm running out of time, I know. And my wife asked me, she said, can you speak for two hours? And then she looked at me, she said, I even ask. There was, uh, there was some guys that's fishing there with me that lives there in my neighborhood. And one of the things they want to do, they want to catch some bigger fish. They said, Stacy said, the biggest thing we've ever caught is 10 or 12 pounds. And you know what I told them? I said, next time you go, don't you fish where you've been fishing. Go somewhere else. And then you know what they tell me? Because we, we are creatures of habit. I mean, you know that. We want to fish where granddaddy fished at, 
and my daddy fished there, and he taught me how to fish there, and we've been, we did catch them there years ago. But what you don't understand, it's flooded and things have filled in and things have changed. And they ain't no longer there. You've been fishing there for the last two years and I ain't caught nothing. I told this guy, he says, all we catch is them little old squealers. He says, Stacy, I want to catch one. A big one, 10, 20 pounds. I said, well, the next time you go, you go the opposite direction of where you've been going. He said, where do I need to go? I said, just don't go where you've been going. I said, wherever you think that they ain't, try that. <laughs> just go try something different. Because for years, we pulled up, we always fish in the same old. And I'm telling you, there was some, there's a lot of good fishermen out there. You never see of them. You never hear about them. They're an old man. That's, I, I can't say that. My dad is uh, getting mad at me. We will pretend he won't say They're old men that's about 75 years old, and they come in, and they always got them. You ever seen that? You don't hear about them on Facebook. You don't see about them in social media. You don't hear none of that. But every time they come in, the old man below the house, he always dips snuff. He was the level ahead of his fellow I ever seen him alive. Because just as much snuff ran on one side as it did the other. But he always come in, he had that old dental sweet snuff. That stuff that looks like powder. I went off fishing one at one time. I told him, I said, Carson, whatever you do, he was in a stick steer boat. We're going down the river. I said, don't you spit. And don't you try to take a dip of that mess as we're going down this river. That stuff done got all up in my eyes. <laughs> he was a white perch fisherman. Everybody else around the house going, Carson, come in. Son, let me show you what I got. Look at this cooler box. And I'm telling you, boy, he'd have slabs up in there. And I got to watching these older guys. Because there was an older guy, Jimmy Peavy's in my, uh, where I live at. They always catching these catfish. And you know, you young boy, you ain't, you ain't paying them for old attention. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, I like to catch them like they're catching them. I notice he ain't fishing the same spots I'm fishing in. Maybe I need to change the way I'm fishing and start fishing like he's fishing. I notice I'm over here, tied up in a top over here, and he's out there in the river on that ledge. Maybe I need to move out there. Once things like that right there, I promise you it will improve your hookup rate. It's going to improve the quality of fish that you're catching. Anybody got any questions? A lot more hookup when I let that fish load that rod up. Yes, I do. And let let him just pull it on down. And I'm telling you, it was a habit I had to break because we grew up fishing with hooks. And you know what my daddy would always say? Son, cross his eyes. That's what he would tell him. That old rod do this right here. Get it in your hand, son. Get it in your hand. Next time he pulls it down, try to cross his eyes. We broke boat seats. <laughs> I mean, boy, I'm telling you, that rod go down. I'm like, Dad, you told me to get everything I got. That old plastic boat seat just wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> so it, your, your hookup rate is going to improve uh, when you let him load that rod up and let him do that right there. Any more questions? I No, I don't. I don't use go. I'm not saying that they're not no good. He asked, do I use goldfish for bait? Don't. I use um, brim, white, uh, brim, bluegill, <clears throat> shad, and then what I tell you earlier, them quill back suckers. <laughs> I use the same thing that I use for this one right here. I snail both of them. As a matter of fact, when I get through, we've got a few minutes, I will show you just how to do that. I snail both hooks in the same line. I take the first hook and I hook it in the lip and I run the next one back and I put it on his back and I hook it in where it sticks sort of straight up off of his back, right behind the dorsal fin. It's sticking up. So if he comes up and gets the back end, he's getting that hook. Yeah, yes, 
I hook them two different ways. I hook them through the lips if there's, a, if there's some current there. My preference is to hook him behind the dorsal fin where he can sit there. He likes to float. You ever seen them? They'll be swimming sideways. But if we get into some current, that, if it's current strong enough, it won't pull him around and that it wants to kill him. That, that water is going to come back through his gills and it wants to kill him. So if you get into some uh, a little bit swiffer brim, take him and hook him through the lip so he can sit there and swim in the current. A little bit easier on him. Lights? No, sir. I, I don't use no kind of lights. As a matter of fact, if I'm out fishing, I'm just a little bit old school. I, I really don't want him to even know that I'm there. Um, a lot of lights set up on my boat, and once I come to a place... If I fish at night, I don't like to move a lot. That's just me preferentially. You may not have a problem with it, but I like to find me about three or four places, and I'm like, we're going to just fish these spots tonight, and I will anchor up on them. Once we get anchored up, I'm like, we're going to sit here for two hours or an hour and a half or two hours, something like that, and I will turn actually all the lights off of my boat just enough that I got some points up on my rod so I can see them. It leaves a little glow there, but I'm like, I don't want him looking up and knowing that it looks like a baseball field lit up. What is the tube you're using? You don't use a bead. I don't use a bead. Let me share this with you. Oh, this is, this is one of my little tricks. So if uh, I don't use a bead, if you go by to the parts house, you can purchase something called um, vacuum hose. Y'all got me? And you can buy the stuff in 10-foot section and buy the one that has the littlest hole in it. And I just take them and bring them to the house and cut them about one inch sections. The reason I do this, this was my thoughts. If this hood, and I know people are talking about, well, put a glass bead on it. Well, that glass bead is just as hard as that lead. So I don't see no difference of that glass bead beating against my knot than that lead beating against it. I don't use that. So I put this on there, and it's... It's just a cushion. It rides right there on the edge of that swivel. Nothing's on my knot. My knot is actually up inside of that. And uh, nothing gets to my knot that way. Vacuum hose. Vacuum hose. You can find it at, and you know, a lot of times, there's some people around here that sell what they call bumper. A little bitty thing, but get you some of this because you can buy a whole roll of it, 10 foot, for like $3 and cut them in one inch sections and put them on there, and I'm telling you, you'll have more than you can fish with in a year. Anybody else? Uh, yes, sir. What pound test do I use? On my reel itself, I have 40 pound mono. On my liter, I've got 50. And the reason why, I know some people think, well, I've got it because I want this line a little bit thicker. That is the reason I've got that. I know 40 pounds on this leader would hold a big fish. But I'm looking for that diameter. That's the way if it does get nicked some, my mind's thinking, well, I got a little bit more beef there that he can nick it and not cut it all the way in half. You see where I'm coming from? So that's what I use. I, no, 40 and 50. 40 and 50. My lines would line with 40. My, uh, that leader there is 50. It's going to have to be something about this nature. If it's just a, a big brim, I don't use, I just use that one hook. But when I get into something like them, what I call them quill back suckers, where they something about uh, 10 to 12 inches long, that's when I go to that double hook thing. What mono? Uh, the, the brand made, made mono that I got, I got some slime line. And I uh, use some line that Bass Pro Shop sells. You can find it over there. It's called Offshore Angler. Uh, I'm always looking for little bargains. And Offshore Angler is in Bass Pro Shop, and you can buy like 700 and something yards of it for 14 bucks or something. Or I use Slime Line. I use both of them right there. My leader on this right here is 50-pound Slime Line is what I got on here. And I found that both of them... Is sort of a good abrasion resistance, you know. Uh, I'd rather have something good abrasion resistance 
than real, real soft type stuff. I'm looking for something that's going to be able to handle some nicks. Them right there is, uh, yeah, them right there is Abu Garcia 6500 C3s. This right here is a tangling with catfish extreme rod that I fish with. And uh, let me cover one more thing. Have I, have I about run out of time? I do. It's about time for me to wrap up here. Let me do this before I do this. There was a reason I use a hook, a, a lid that slides. The same reason that you see that catfish pull that rod over and let it back. I don't want him, I feel like if my hook, my lid is on the bottom, and if it's sort of buried down in the mud, I don't want when he goes to pull it to him to feel the resistance of this lead. I want that line. And I have had it where they pull it over like that and hold it. I will actually reach up and take this reel, hit that, and hit my clip. Because I'm like, next time he starts to pull it over, he's not going to feel even that much tension. He's going to start to tick, 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 tick. Then when it starts to go so much, I'm just going to reach out, flip it back up, and the rod just loads on up, and bam. I got him. Any more questions? I just fillet one side of him. I just fillet one side and sit there and just let that flap. I would say if I've been sitting in a place for 30 or 45 minutes, uh, I'm going to reel it back up. If I go to a new place, if I reel my brim in and he's sitting here there swimming, uh, I'm going to put him back in my bait tank, you know, if I'm moving, and I'm just going to be pouring water over the top of him, trying to revive him, but uh, uh, some of this, uh, that shad that we've cut, once I really mean, and if I got, if, if I, if I've got plenty of it, if I've got plenty of it, I'm going through it, now if I don't, you just got to do what you got to do, but if you got plenty of bait, I'm telling you, about 30 or 40 minutes, if you want to change, I, I don't, I'm like, Let's put some fresh stuff on there. Because you've seen probably when you pull that shad out of that tank, he's slimy, he's got a look to him, he's shiny, he's got a smell to him. He sits there in that water for 45 minutes or an hour. He no longer has that look to him. No, I, I sit right there. Uh, now, what I do have a tendency, especially when the water, if, if it's cold temperature, I'll have a tendency to sit there longer uh, than I would if the temperature was up to 70 degrees. I will pull up and I'll say, I'm going to fish this spot. And I will literally look at my watch and say it's 9.30. I'm like at around 10 or 10, 10, 10. We're rolling up and moving. Now, if it's cold, I'm like, we may sit here two hours. Because uh, sometimes, if I, if I have seen them fish on my graph and know that they're there, I'm like, we're just going to sit here and give them, I know this, they, they're slower uh, biting. And I'm really, when it gets down to that cold, I'm just out fishing. And I'm like, I'm just after you. And I, I come with the mindset, I will sit here and wait you out. And that's the way I think about it. I like it back at home. When I water temperature, favorite time of the year. When I water temperature around Thanksgiving and it starts dropping, and I will fish for them real hard and heavy till it gets around to around 50 degrees. When it gets down to about 50 degrees, you know, I sort of give up on a little bit, or if I do go, and it's just down around 48, I will pull, I have pulled up to a hole and sit there all day and catch two fish. But you know, you catch two good ones out of it. I'm like, well, that's what I come here for. I, I come to catch a big fish out of it. I would, look, I would look for some kind of cover. That's what I would look for. Some kind of rock, some kind of structure. Beaver dam, Beaver dam anything like that is going to produce a place for him to get. I'm going to close with this. Don't walk off on me. I need about five minutes of your attention. Don't you go nowhere, Terry. <laughs> In 2008, 
They, America put together an Olympic track team. They had the fastest guys at the time on this track team. His name was Tyson Gay. One time he was the world's fastest man. He's, and America's team had always been known for having some of the fastest athletes in the world. The only other team that even could com compare to the American track team was probably, you know who they are, the Jamaicans. They had this guy, you probably never heard of him. His name is Usain Bolt. America now has been put into this competition and everybody is looking, everybody is excited about the Olympic four by 100 rally. The competition, USA is in the semifinals. Not even made it to the finals. No competition for them. The closest thing they had in the semifinals was a team by the name of France, and they weren't even hardly on the track with them. So everybody has built this race up. That man, Jamaica and the U.S., nobody can even run with. There was no competition for them. And they sounded the gun. And the man that had the baton in his hand began to run. If you know anything about racing, a four this thing in their hand called a baton. And he'll run one leg. And when he gets to a place, he hands it to another man. And the other man takes off running. And he'll run so far and he gives it to another man. And he takes off running. And he gets to the last man and he hands it to him and he runs the final leg. The running part wasn't the problem. It was the exchanging of the baton. And somehow or another in the middle of it all, the United lost their focus. They have the lead and it's not even close. And they go to exchange it to a man that at the time was the world's, he was America's fastest man, Tyson Gay. They went to try to get in his hand and guess what he done? He dropped the baton. Now let me share this with you. They gave me an opportunity to share a little bit of spiritual stuff. Because we're men in here today and God has placed something in your hand. You have a spiritual baton. If you like me, I had sons and daughters. And you know what job mine was? To be the spirit leader of my house. To make sure that I pass on what's in me and place it into them. Matter of fact, Paul said this about Timothy. He said, Timothy, I can see the faith that abides in you, but it just did not start with you. It started with your grandmama, and you know what his grandmama done? She passed what she had on to her daughter. You know what her daughter done? She passed what she had on to her son. You have a spiritual obligation, men, as spiritual leaders of your home, to be the man that's passing the time from one generation to the next. Take it seriously. Bless you. Have a great afternoon.